like to welcome you to worship this morning. If you will, take your order of service in your hymnal and stand with me as we sing together hymn number three, Worthy of Worship. The King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign. King is exalted on high. Alleluia.
you go ahead and be seated just for a moment. I want us to have a prayer time together, but I want to give you these directions as we do. I know there are a whole lot of things that we could pray for and we need to pray about. But I'd like for us to focus on two in particular today. Our nation is about to elect a new president. That merits our attention. It merits our involvement. It merits our prayer. I'd like for us to pray about that election. Pray for our country. Pray for our direction. Some other things that are going on during this time of year involve us as a denomination. There are many of our state conventions that are meeting. Some have already met. Some will meet this week and in the coming weeks. Many making important decisions, important decisions about the kingdom, about uh, the work of the ministry and what God is doing. I want us to pray for those state conventions. So here's what I'd ask you to do. I just want to ask you to, to just scoot over and to somebody next to you in groups of about three. It must take no more than about two minutes uh, to pray for those things if we could. And just you in those groups, would you go before the Lord uh, for those two requests? And in just a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask Joe Elaine, one of our Ph.D. students, also one of our adjunct uh, professors uh, teaching in the area of preaching, to come up here. Uh, and in about two minutes, just close our prayer time by leading us in prayer. So if you would, just get in uh, some small groups, take just a few minutes, and let's pray about the upcoming election. Let's pray for our state conventions. Maybe you want to mention specifically the convention of uh, the state that represents your home uh, as we lift them before the Lord. Father, we come before You this morning, Your wonderful throne of grace. Thank You for inviting us into Your holy presence. Lord, You're such an awesome God. You're a mighty God. And we worship You this morning with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And Lord, we do bring our nation before You this morning. We intercede on behalf of the nation this morning. 
Lord, we know that Your Scripture says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Father God, we pray right now that as this election will take place, that righteousness will prevail. God, that whoever may be elected, that they'll seek Your face. They'll seek the wisdom that can only come from You, Lord. And Lord, that as Christians, we'll pray for our leaders. We'll be salt and light. Lord, knowing that only as people are born again into the kingdom of God will their values, their morals be changed. So may we be diligent about sharing the gospel and sharing your love. And then we pray for the state conventions that are going on that will be in the days ahead. As your leaders, your people make serious decisions about the kingdom of God, that we'll put aside our wants. We'll put aside our differences and we'll seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. And that we'll be about the kingdom work. Lord, we know that a house divided cannot stand. May we be united upon Jesus Christ and His shed blood and the Word of God. We love you this morning, Lord. We worship you. We pray for our speaker, Brother Tommy, this morning as he shares the Word of God. And as he unfolds it this morning, just give him a fresh anointing as he shares in the power of the Spirit of God. And may we have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit speaks to us today before we ask our prayer. And we voice it in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you, Joe. In addition to uh, being a student and uh, an adjunct professor, Joe is also a pastor in the Baton Rouge area, just across the river uh, on the west side. And we have the privilege today of hearing God's Word brought to us by another pastor in the Baton Rouge area. Pastor Tommy French is the pastor of the Jefferson Baptist Church uh, in Baton Rouge. And I got to tell you, when you look at his resume, um, it's not very impressive as far as pastoral experience because uh, he's only pastored two churches. And by uh, the way that some people measure experience, that doesn't seem like a whole lot uh, with the way uh, pastors change churches today. But what you have to do is you have to look close at the dates on those two churches. Because after a church prior to his seminary work at Southwestern Seminary, Dr. French became the pastor of the Jefferson Baptist Church in 1958. And he has been the pastor of that church ever since. Told me a while ago that he thinks he might stay there. Uh, what a tremendous testimony, students, I want to tell you. Pastoral tenure may be the most overlooked and under-discussed factor of church growth and church health today. And we appreciate that testimony. Dr. French is not only a pastor, but he is a denominational servant as well. He has been serving this last year as president of the Louisiana Baptist Convention. We'll bring a presidential address in the upcoming meeting there. I want you to pray for him in that regard. He was also elected in June as the second vice president of the Southern Baptist Convention and is leading us in that capacity. But he also uh, serves in another capacity, and that is one directly related to our school. Though he is not a graduate of this institution, his church hosts one of our extension centers in the Baton Rouge area and makes available space there uh, for uh, classroom teaching and for students to train there. Uh, Dr. French, we are grateful for your ministry to us. We look forward to hearing the Word of God from you today. Thank you. I ask you to stand with me again as we have another time of worship and song. Hymn number 486 and then hymn number 499. Master, Thou callest, I gladly obey. Only direct me, and I'll find Thy way. Teach me the mission appointed for me. What is my labor? 
my soul, refining me, making me whole. And no matter what I may lose, I choose the refiner's fire. I'm learning now to trust His touch, to crave the fire's embrace. For though my past with sin was etched, His mercies did erase. Each time His purging cleanses deeper, I'm not sure that I'll survive, yet the strength in growing weaker keeps my hungry soul alive. my soul desires, purged and cleansed and purified, then the Lord be glorified, He is consuming my soul, refining me, making me I choose the refiner's fire. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you, Dr. Lombard. You need to learn to play the piano like that, don't you? We set up a scholarship at Jefferson. We found out that a lot of people are putting their children into private school and they don't have money for music lessons. And I said, we can't have that. We have to have a generation of students now that in the future can play the instruments for God's people in the future. We need to think about that. And we need to provide that, uh, that ability it's absolutely incredible. There's no other denomination, no other religion on the face of the earth that has something to sing about like Christians do. And praise God for it. Thank you, Dr. Shattuck, for introducing me. Is uh, Jimmy Hedrick here? Dr. Look at there. He's here. Uh, Dr. Jimmy Hedrick and I go back a long way. He was my music and youth director when he got out of high school and uh, helped me build Jefferson Baptist Church. His father was our church treasurer. His sister was a member. She sang in our first youth choir. Uh, they made a joyful noise. And uh, you'll understand what I'm talking about there. But uh, I appreciate Dr. Hedrick and his work here uh, at uh, New Orleans. I was glad to see that you were able to get him away from Southwestern. And uh, Southwestern's great loss, your great gain. And so I appreciate that so very much. Uh, I was trying to read the music a while ago, and uh, I'm nearsighted, have been nearsighted since 1937. I've always had to wear glasses. Of course, they protected me in a lot of fights because they wouldn't hit me if I had glasses on. And you didn't grow up in the old figure, did you? And uh, and then I went, got farsighted, so I had to have bifocals, and, uh, and now I have cataracts, and everything is doubled, so the audience is twice as large as it normally is this morning. Uh, Anyway, uh, those things will happen, but when it happens, just keep on serving Jesus. Uh, most people won't know it if you don't tell them about it. Our scripture this morning is taken from Ephesians chapter 4, and if you would like to follow, uh, please do so. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. Ephesians 4, beginning at chapter 1, I mean, verse chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and then verses 11 and 12. 
I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then verse 11, And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, or teaching pastors, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. 1953, at age 23, I was called in August as pastor of the Harmony Baptist Church of Caldwell, Texas. Now, they had a service every other Sunday afternoon, and uh, the pastor who was there, and of course the church was organized in 1865 and had always had just one service every other Sunday afternoon since that time, the pastor who had been there had been there 43 years, and he was 72 years of age. And I thought, this man has been here forever, and he's as old as Methuselah. Well, looks like I'm almost about to catch up with Brother Broadus. A few years I'll be there where he is. And it's just been like a, uh, a watch in the night. It's suddenly here and it's suddenly gone. Uh, the church was located on a muddy road off of the main highway. And it leaned toward the right. Thank goodness it didn't lean toward the left. And, uh, and they had a wooden stove in there. And uh, the, one of the deacons, when it was cold, would, uh, would uh, stoke the stove and turn open the damper. And as the uh, red on the stove pipe went up toward the ceiling, that was from the heat, then another deacon would get nervous and he would turn the damper down. Now, I'm preaching all during this time, okay? Uh, and the, the, uh, the church was so old, it had a hump in the middle, and... And, of course, if somebody was heavier on this side of the pew than that side of the pew, then it was a seesaw effect. I'm telling you, we had some great times in that church. And uh, and so one day, the road was extremely muddy on the way to the church, and I had picked up Brother Broadus, and thank God for him. I learned a lot of polity and a lot of pastoral work from him while I was at Baylor and uh, in the seminary. And on the way down there, he said this to me. He said, now, Tommy, you stay in the roots. I said, what? He said, you keep this car in the roots. I said, the roots are very deep, uh, Brother Broad. He said, that's exactly right, son. But if you get out of the roots, you're going to end up in the ditch. I learned a lesson from him there about pastoring and about the Word of God. You stay in the Word of God and don't get away from it, and don't go to the right or to the left, because if you do, you're going to end up in a theological ditch. I want to talk to you this morning about God's call servants and the work of the ministry. This is both for men and women. Uh, My wife told me after I had informed her, this was before we were married, that I felt God calling me to preach, and I said, I need to discuss with you this with you. Uh, We're engaged, and And you need to understand that God's calling me to preach. Now, where do you stand in this matter? And she said, well, I want to tell you something. Several years ago, God told me I need to be a pastor's wife. It really stunned me that God had worked in her life ahead of time. And I want to speak to those of you who will work in every area of church ministry, because it's very important to understand from the biblical standpoint of the work of the ministry and especially of the pastor or the overseer of the church. The Bible tells us that God called special people for special work, and he sets in place in the church specific leaders for specific work. Apostles, and of course we don't have apostles with us anymore. Some denominations have, have apostles, but they also have an extra experience that, uh, that's led them to a latter-day revelation. And it's led to them all kinds of deviant uh, theology. But he put in place apostles, 
prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are teaching pastors. And they're there for specific work. I want you to notice something. They're not called by the church. My calling was not from my local church. Incidentally, uh, while growing up and before I became a pastor, I had the experience of being a member of ten different churches. Not one church experience, but ten different churches experience. And let me speak to you about those experiences beginning in, in, in 1935. You could go to almost any Southern Baptist church, and you immediately felt at home. You immediately identified with a common theology and with a common worship service and with a common belief. And so when I went to all these different churches, no matter whether the pastor had a degree or whether he was degreed or whether he had a graduate degree, these churches were all the same. The preachers preached in similar fashion. Jesus is the only way, and he taught that we're to win the world to Christ and carry out the Great Commission. Now, I want to point out to you that church does not call ministers. God calls ministers. That's the way he sets it up. And the Scripture tells us in 1 Timothy, it is a holy calling. I'm amazed today at some uh, denominations who have decided that they would recruit their pastors on the basis of it's a good profession. Now, if you've entered the ministry based upon you think it's a good profession, then let me suggest you resign from the seminary today and go get you some other work. Unless God has specifically laid his hand on you as a pastor and called you for that work, you're in serious danger. I've seen many a man that entered the ministry based upon profession, and he always ended up as a shipwreck in his personal profession. And let me tell you what's happening in other denominations. They're calling men into the ministry based upon a good profession. And as a result of that, they have an excellent retirement program, so the men are bailing out at age 55, and there's a shortage of ministers there, and the women are stepping in and saying, ordain us. Now, you need to read B.H. Carroll and what he had to say about that in his interpretation of the English Bible. It's very important that you understand that. I want to tell you, when God called me, he called me, and I have no doubt about how he called me and what he said to me in that calling. Incredible experience of calling me into the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is what holds me in the ministry, because I know that though I could do many other things, there's only one thing I can do to please my heavenly Father, and that is to be a pastor of a local church and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by his grace, he sustained me there, and you need to understand that. Uh, I have been before other churches, and they didn't call me as pastor, and I went away wondering, why in the world has this happened? Sometimes I became discouraged. I was telling Dr. Shattuck this morning about a church that interviewed me when I was 27, having finished my degree and, and having five years' experience in the pastorate, and they called me later and said, we want somebody at least 30 years of age. That's pretty shattering, isn't it? I want to tell you now, I'm glad I didn't get the church. Other churches I'm glad God didn't let me have because I realized that God was leading in what he was doing and he knew exactly where I needed to be and what I needed to be doing and so I accepted his grace in that matter. And I say that to you today because a lot of times what we want is, is not what is good for us. And we need to seek the face of the Heavenly Father and be sure that when we accept a call anywhere, we know it's the Father's will. Right after we started the mission church at Jefferson, I had been working at the freight line, and First Baptist Church uh, sent me out there and they said, now you have to keep your job at the freight line. You're going to be bivocational. I said, that's fine. One month later, a church in Baton Rouge came to me where I had been interim pastor and said, come on, our pastor just left. We've heard you preach. We know who you are. We'll furnish you a parsonage. We'll pay you $500 a month. Remember, this is 1958. We'll pay your utility bill. We'll give you a car allowance. You can't believe what they were offering. And I said to them, I cannot come. And they said, why? And I said, I have accepted the call of the mission of First Baptist Church. Oh, you can leave that. Anybody can handle that. 
And I said, no, they cannot handle that. God has called me there. They were angry with me because I would not release the mission to somebody else and go and pastor their church. I want to tell you, it's a wise decision to stay in the will of God. And I want to encourage you, wherever you serve, whatever God's called you to do, you go where God wants you to go. And here's the reason. If that's where God wants you, there's not anyone in that church can remove you. If that's not where God wants you, there's not anyone in the church that can keep you there. You see, you are God's special servant, and he wants, he wants you to serve him where he wants you to serve. And when you serve him in that way, you're under his blessings, no matter how difficult the way might be or might seem. Secondly, God's servants have specific duties. Guard the flock as an under-shepherd of Jesus Christ. That's your task. I guard Jefferson Baptist Church as if it were my child. I help give it birth. I have a life invested there. And every person that God sends to that congregation, I have the privilege but the responsibility of guarding that flock. And the scripture says, one day I will give an account to the Heavenly Father of how I have served that congregation and how I have guarded them, and I'll give an account for keeping their souls. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 10, he said, the shepherd, the good shepherd, he said, I'm the good shepherd, lays down his life for the sheep. The hireling, when he sees the the wolf coming, he flees because he's a hireling. But the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We have far too many hirelings over the flocks of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you go to serve a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you go there as an under-shepherd of the one who gave himself on Calvary's cross for us, who died for our sins, who paid the price for our sins, who rose from the dead to give us life eternal, So we can identify with him in eternal life, and as a result of that, we then become his under-shepherds, and we are there to protect and take care of and look after the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, are there some wavered sheep in the flock? Always. Are there some mean sheep in the flock? Always. Are there some sheep that won't follow you? Always. But that does not cause you to neglect your duty as the under-shepherd of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you accept that call, then you become the guardian of the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Something else you need to do is you need to oversee the flock. A lady one time, when I appointed a special committee and had a joint committee meeting with three committees, called me on the telephone, and she said, I want to know by what right you've done this. And I said, it's simple. I'm the pastor. I'm the pastor. I'm the overseer. I oversee the committees. Now, some of the young guys out there call me a benevolent dictator. Fellas, you haven't been with me in some of these committee meetings. I want to tell you something. I have taken the heat, and I have taken the knocks, and I have withstood all kinds of serious criticism, but I am the overseer. I oversee every committee that works. I don't tell them what to do, but if they do something that's wrong, I tell them this is not right. In fact, one day in a committee meeting, I said, now, I'm not going to oppose you on the church floor, but you put in the minutes that I, as pastor of this church, oppose what you're doing because you're going to get yourself in trouble and you're going to cause disturbance in the local body. Sure enough, one month later, the entire committee had resigned because they got themselves in trouble. You, if you're called to be the under-shepherd, you become the overseer. Now, that doesn't mean you rule dictatorially. That's not what Christ called us to do. He said, you're not like the Gentiles. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to lead in service and in love. That's the kind of leadership you have, a servant leadership like our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to point this out to you from 
plain old personal experience watching Dr. Norris Palmer of First Baptist Church, watching Dr. Bro- Brother Broadus at Harmony Baptist Church over in Texas, watching my pastors. You are the overseer, and don't you let anyone remove you from that position or to take your place. Because God holds you accountable for overseeing the work of the local church. And that's what you're to do. We hear a lot today about shared ministry, and I'm for shared ministry. But I want, I want you to know something. A lot of that is simply to try to dethrone the power and the, uh, and the requirement of God to oversee his church. And don't you let that happen. Why do you think God called you as pastor? He called you to be that under-shepherd of Jesus Christ, and he called you to look after that flock and to take care of that flock, and you oversee it. You oversee and be sure that finance committee is doing their work. You oversee and be sure that that personnel committee is doing its work. You oversee every committee in that church, and you oversee the body of Christ, and be sure they're doing their work as the New Testament required that work to be done. And then... You need to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's your job. You're not to do all the ministry. You can't do all the ministry. And I'll tell you that experience. I've tried it. It doesn't work. They'll let you do all the work. You are to equip that church for ministry. You need to know how to win people to Christ, and then you need to sit down and teach your people how to win people to Christ. You need to have a heart for souls. You need to sit down and teach your people how to to have a heart for souls. You need, in every way, to equip your people in the area of ministry. I'm going to speak to you about polity in a few minutes and talk to you about doctrine in a few minutes. But your responsibility is to teach your people everything that the Lord wants them to know. You remember what the Great Commission command is, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And then, lo, as you go, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. And you need to teach your people, and in order to do that, you have to know what to do. That means you must study. Here at the seminary, they're going to give you a set of tools. When you get out of here, your study has just begun in the Word of God and in every area. You're going to have some good tools to operate with. But when you walk into that pulpit on Sunday morning, when you walk into that Sunday school class on Sunday morning, if you're an educational director and you're leading an educational program in a local church, if you're a music uh, leader and you're out there leading in worship, you need to study and study and study and you have a fresh word from God every time you walk into that pulpit or every time you lead that congregation or that Sunday school class or that department or that program. Because the work of Christ depends upon that. And it's important that you equip the saints for the work of ministry. Once you equip them and turn them loose with all the wonderful uh, uh, equipment that God gives them and talents that he gives them, you're going to be surprised what happens. The church will explode in its work. And then, let me point out something else. Once you teach them proper doctrine, the flock will always tell you in advance when there's an aberrant theology out there. Not long ago, about 12 years ago, I guess, in our Sunday school lesson, uh, <clears throat> some professor had written about the Star of Bethlehem. And what he was writing about the Star of Bethlehem, the Broadman Commentary, I'm sorry, the New American Commentary of 1888 had shot that theory down back in the 1800s. And my people came out of the Sunday school classes and they said, Preacher, Look what's in here. I said, what's wrong with it? And they told me what was wrong with it because they knew their doctrine. And you need to teach them strong doctrine so that they understand what the Bible has to say. Set the example. What is it Titus said? Live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That's what we're to do as ministers and as religious workers. We are to set the example for the flock of God. Paul said, follow thou my example. And we need to do that today. Say to the church, follow me, follow my example. And then teach them sound doctrine. What did Titus, what did Paul write to Titus? Speak the things which are fitting of sound doctrine. We have every wind of doctrine flowing out there today. The advent of television, you have every kind of religious show, and I call them shows, that you've ever seen. We had a, several years ago, uh, we were visiting somewhere, I think it was up near Ohio, and 
and they had a faith heater on there. He hit this fellow in the head and cast out demon of tobacco. He did. At least he said he did. And the guy finally got up and walked off the stage, and my daughter looked at me and said, Daddy, that can't be real. I said, no, it can't be real, but why is it it's not real? She said, it doesn't measure up to the Scriptures. I said, you're exactly right. You need to teach these folks the sound doctrine and teach them some church polity. I'm amazed at the abysmal ignorance of church polity today. I heard not long ago that uh, a couple got married, and you know what they did at the, at the marriage ceremony? The uh, bride and groom exchanged the Lord's Supper with one another. Isn't that wonderful? Where'd that come from? A sacerdotal religion that influences our people. If you'll read what Paul has to say about the problems in the Corinthian church, it was the fact that they were taking the Lord's Supper by themselves or in groups and not as a church. And to take the Lord's Supper between the husband and wife is an abuse and misuse of the Lord's Supper because it's not a participation in or a communion with or a uh, participation in uh, between the husband and the wife and the bride and the groom is between the individual believing the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who it's with. And Paul said, if you take it in an unworthy manner, you, you've got problems. But we have Baptists who are so ignorant of theology and polity that this goes on and the Lord's Supper becomes an appendage to the wedding service, like the unity candle. We need to teach our people what's right and wrong. We need to teach them what the Scripture has to say about these things. It's very important we do that. And then keep your speech clean. I know a fellow in Baton Rouge. He's a good preacher, but he's got a dirty mouth. And our speech needs to be clean at home and at church. Listen to what the Scripture says. Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. You're not to be one of the boys, and you're not to participate in unclean words. God wants a clean servant to speak clean words for a clean and wholesome gospel to a lost world. That's the way the world operates. And then we need to live above reproach. Not only live as an example, but whatever we do, let not any reproach come upon the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And another thing we need to do is to be alert and stand firm in the faith. What are we to be alert to? Strange doctrine. Crazy doctrine. It's important we understand exactly what we as Baptists believe. One man came to me and said, Preacher, you're overdoing this Baptist bit. I said, What are you talking about? He said, You're always talking about what we Baptists believe. I said, That's because that's what we believe, dear brother. That's what sets us apart from other people. This is where we are. I'm not a Baptist because I was born into a Baptist family. I'm a Baptist because they're the ones that won me the Lord Jesus Christ. And after studying the Scripture, I said, That's what I want to be. But we have some strange winds blowing. And we need to understand what the Scripture says and be alert to those things. Always alert. And then stand firm. Paul says, having done all, just stand. Don't be moved by strange doctrine. Don't be moved by aberrant theology. Stand firm according to the Word of the living God. And then something else. Remember... Who called you? Somebody asked me, who do you go? Who's your buddy? Who you confess to? Who you go and talk to about your problems? I said, Jesus. He never tells anybody else anything. Do you know that? He hears me. He answers my prayers. He hears my hurting heart. He sees my desperate soul. I go to him because he called me to do this work. Let me tell you something else you can do. This is very important. If somebody does something mean to you, be a tattletale. 
Go tell Jesus on them. Now, you may laugh at that. Let me give you a for instance. I had a lady one day call me and say, we're praying that we'll have another pastor and we're hoping you'll leave as soon as possible. Praise God. Isn't that wonderful? And um, I prayed for her. And I looked at myself and examined my ministry to see if maybe I was wrong. You need to always examine yourself. But I said, Lord, I don't know what to do with this, but I'm going to put it in your hands because I'm not guilty of what has been said, and there's no reason for this. She had surgery, minor surgery. All of a sudden, her blood pressure went to 300, and she died. It floored me. But she had been so vocal within the church, it said to the church, be careful of accusing the pastor of things that are not true. Remember who calls you. And if you have to tell on anybody, tell it to Jesus. Don't tell it to the deacons and don't tell it to the church and don't tell it to others who won't understand. You go to the Lord. Lord, you call me. I've got a problem here. You handle it. Sometimes it handles drastically. Sometimes it's gentle. But remember who calls you. Paul, God said to Abraham in, in uh, the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis after he had come back from defeating the kings of Shinar. He said, Abraham, I am your shield and your perfect treasure. You need to remember this. You see, Abraham was that special call person out of the Ur of the Chaldees to start a nation through a blessed promised son ending up through David, King David, and ultimately through Jesus Christ. And God said to Abraham, because Abraham didn't know if the kings of Shinar would come back and try to attack him, I am your shield. You see, you don't have to go out and defend yourself as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, because the eternal God of the universe is your shield. And you must remember that. No matter how many forces you may feel sometimes against you, from Satan to an antagonistic church member, the Lord Jesus Christ is your shield. And he is your perfect treasure. Jesus said, all that live godly will suffer persecution. Remember that. If they've done this, Jesus said to the green tree, what will they do to the dry? Paul the Apostle said, we've not yet suffered unto the shedding of blood. Some of our Christian friends in the world have suffered unto the shedding of blood. But before you think that you've become a great martyr, you remember those that have suffered unto the shedding of blood for the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's important you understand that. And then, listen to those that God gives you for counsel, the deacons and others. I remember when Dr. Carlson taught the final Hebrew class I took at Southwestern Seminary in the summer of 57. And here's what he said. He said, boys, <clears throat> you've got to love the deacons, warts and all. And I want to tell you, he's, he was right. You've got to love the deacons, warts and all. See them as partners in ministry, not as enemies. And if one seeks to become an enemy, just take his name to the Heavenly Father and ask the Father if it's possible that he can make a friend out of him. One time we had a lady in the church that was just really acting ugly and I had just had enough of it. I called the chairman of deacons. I said, we've got to church her. You didn't think I'd do that, huh? He said, you've got to do what? I said, we need to church her. I'm tired of her mouth. I'm tired of her running her mouth. I'm tired of the way she's acting. He said, preacher, nobody pays any attention to her. I said, what? He said, nobody pays any attention to her. I said, you've got to be kidding. He said, no. He said, let it go. Nobody pays any attention to her. I said, okay. I took his counsel. 
I buried her in her good graces, buried her dear husband in his good graces. She was just out of sorts for a while. And you need to remember this. Listen to the counsel of those who God sends you to help you in the work of ministry. But remember this. Not only is he your shield, he is your perfect treasure. And the scripture says he's raised us up and caused us to sit in heavenly places. That's as of now. That in the ages to come, age after age after age after age after age, he may show to us the exceeding riches of his grace. You see, we don't even understand grace. But one day when we sit in that heavenly place with our heavenly Father and with our Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to open the windows of knowledge and display to us really and truly how exceeding are his riches of grace towards sinners like you and me. Praise God he had mercy upon us and called us into his service. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for each one of these students and professors. You've called them to your service. They're serving you. I bless them in your name today. Father, I pray that you'll give each one the strength that they need, the, the solid mind that they must have, the grip upon the gospel that they need to carry out your work. Give the professors the knowledge they need to impart to these students those things that will equip them to help the churches be equipped for the work of ministry. Bless their work. We thank you for them. We thank you for this institution and for those that paid the price to make it possible. And I pray for every student, for every minister, for every educational uh, person, for every music person, for every one called into your ministry, whatever area of service it might be, bless them in your name and give them the strength to stand firm in the faith and to strengthen the work of the gospel through your church, to your glory, to your honor, to the salvation of the lost. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.